Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Veg Networking Canada. We honor, acknowledge, and respect that many of us are located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of many Indigenous peoples of Canada. Veg Networking Canada is a community where vegan plant based companies connect and collaborate. Today, we have a special guest with us. He has roughly 40 years of human resources and organizational development experience. He's a champion of going beyond the futile net zero and limited impact sustainability initiatives that many corporations enact. He's the author of the European business bestseller titled, Will the Real Leader Please Stand Up? He's a world traveler and founder of Peace of Heaven Project Animal Sanctuary. Veg Networking Canada is pleased to introduce the co-founder of Plant Based Future. Welcome, Mark Starmer. Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you, Justin. Uh, very kind introduction. Very pleased to be here. We are very pleased to have you here. And for everybody who's listening, can you tell us a little bit more about your own personal plant based vegan origin story? Sure. Um, well, probably in common with many of the people who are watching or listening in, um, I've always been an animal lover. Um, I had a great passion for animals when I was a child, probably more so um, than I like people, to be honest. And as I grew up, um, I became ever more conscious of how bad it was that we were actually doing things to these creatures that I loved. And you can cut it off up to a point and then you get to a certain point where you're in control of your own destiny. To my eternal shame, that didn't come until 1990 when I actually went um, full-time vegetarian. I'd kind of dabbled since the 80s uh, with being pescatarian and I went full-time vegetarian at, uh, at 1990. I then ended up working for HSBC um, globally. And the very first thing that was said to me on my first day there was, whatever you served in whatever the part of the world that you're in, eat it. And so it was very, very difficult to maintain a vegetarian lifestyle. When I worked for HSBC for seven years, I was actually responsible for um, training their most senior managers all around the globe. I ended up working with them for, for 38 different countries. And my food experiences then were horrendous. Um, I saw some awful things in food markets in the Far East, the kind of stories that we hear about in relation to how COVID came about. Well, it's all very, very real. It's very horrific. Um, I was put off the, uh, the, the idea of doing any harm to animals because there are obscene things that happen. Um, however, going vegetarian, um, uh, and again, full time after I left HSBC, I didn't make the connection between vegetarianism and veganism. I couldn't see why people actually went vegan. And I struggled with it. And I met a number of vegan people and they said, I'm vegan. And my answer was always, why? There's, there's no harm in drinking milk or eating eggs, surely. And looking back, the silly part about that, maybe the annoying part for me is that nobody ever put me right. Nobody, nobody corrected me. And then in 2010, I was actually on Facebook and it, there was a suggested site came up for me and the site was called redefining animal slaughter as murder and i went into it and it wasn't particularly hard hitting in the way that the title might suggest but but it just discussed issues surrounding uh, vegetarianism and veganism and i, I went through the site uh, the, the, the the page rather and i went upstairs my, my my computer's in the basement i went upstairs to my wife and i said we're going vegan today and quite literally, I went and I cleared out everything in the cupboards that was non-vegan. Um, I took it down to our neighbours who were hunters and, and very much into uh, non-vegan things. And we never looked back. Um, our son uh, uh, was living with us, still lives with us. Um, he was forced to go vegan. And my daughter, who was at UBC, um, when she came home, she struggled with the fact that uh, her parents had changed their their, dry, their dietary needs completely. Um, but over the years, she became vegan as well. She's also a very staunch vegan. And I would probably describe us now as a, as a family of militant vegans. It's actually very difficult um, to know me and not be vegan because I'll give you such a hard time. So that's my story. 
Oh, if if anybody and everybody listening had a lot of chuckles and head nods during that, uh, that's great. That was an amazing um, story about your own your own transition, and I think a lot of points in there that people can really relate to, whether they're already there or not there yet. So that's very interesting. Thank you. Now, moving on, Veg Networking Canada is centered around business and entrepreneurship, and that's the second question we ask our special guest: is what is your entrepreneur origin story? Um, it sounds like you were within HSBC, you were very much a, almost an entrepreneur at that point, but can you tell us more about your entrepreneur story, how that unfolded? Yeah, sure. I mean, in, in some respects, I feel like a bit of a fraud. Um, I've never thought of myself as an entrepreneur, but um, whilst I was working globally for HSBC, because I was actually uh, tasked to develop the people who were actually running the bank, the, the, what, what they then called international officers, they're now called international managers. These are people who can be picked up and, and, and dropped into any country anywhere in the world in the, in the hundreds of places that HSBC operate. Um, I became very concerned with leadership and that was my, my big interest. I actually left because I wanted to write a book about what I'd learned about leadership. Um, and you mentioned it in, in the intro, it was called The Real Leader, Please Stand Up. Um, it was a long time ago now. It was actually 1998. I, I know I look 27, but I'm a bit older. And so I wrote this book and somewhat to my surprise, it became a, a European bestseller. Um, that ended up in me facing a lot of demand for people wanting me to come and train their people. So I started a company which was called Proactive Interactive. Um, then people started to say to me, well, how do you prove that you're making a difference? Can you actually prove that people are leaders or, or, or they're not? And so I thought about that for some while and I developed um, a software suite which would actually measure things which people had previously regarded as only qualifiable and I made them quantifiable and I created a second company which was called um did I say the first one was proactive interactive okay the second one was proactive interactive sorry the first one was proactive consulting um the the suite the software suite I sold for two and a half million dollars um in 2001 which put me in a fantastic position because I could then do what I wanted wherever um, in the world. All my money is gone now, by the way. Um, if I were to jump forward um, 15 years in my story, um, and this is where my, my entrepreneurial status actually changed a lot. I got to the point in my career where I was doing a lot, which was helping businesses be greedier, be better at being greedy. Um, and the the misalignment between what I was actually experiencing as an individual and, and my feelings about what we were doing to the, to the world around us and to the animal kingdom um, made me very uncomfortable doing that. So I kind of semi-retired. Um, by this time, we'd, we'd gotten into dog rescue. I suppose I should point that out. And um, we actually have, uh, we've rescued over the years, um, 84 dogs over the past 24 years. We've still got 38 with us. Um, and uh, all your money goes quickly when you do things like that. But we actually had to move. We used to live in Alberta. We moved from Alberta because we basically got thrown out because you can't have that many dogs in Alberta. Um, not very popular with the, uh, the farming community there. So we moved to um, BC, which is where we live now. We live in a very remote area uh, in West Kootenays. So real interior, middle of nowhere stuff. Again, um, big farming community don't, don't particularly like us because of what we do because what we did was to start an animal sanctuary. Uh, that's called the Peace of Heaven Project. It's now probably maybe the largest, maybe the second largest farm animal sanctuary in the whole of BC. Um, we've got over 120 animals. I kind of lose count, to be honest, um, because uh, the, the, the geese keep breeding and, and that pushes the numbers up. But um, that was, if, if you like, a, a foray into, if I can put it this way, for good, entrepreneurism and that was what became my my prime interest so it, it sucked away all of the, the the money that we had and so um i needed to carry on working and still doing things in the development arena so i then got into esg um environmental social governance issues massive now and then dei had actually been doing dei work since the the, the 1990s um, my whole life has been basically an exhibition of, or an experience of 
dealing with DEI issues. My, my wife is, is, is a person of colour. Um, my son is with special needs. I'm actually physically handicapped. I'm actually a third of my baby that you can't tell looking at the screen. I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones who got away. So I, I knew lots about the, the experience of people in this area. And so I was trying to make a difference to uh, workplaces working in these areas, but at the same time, bringing people to think about veganism. Most of what I do has actually been um, uh, a way of introducing vegan concepts to people, to organizations. Um, I use veganism as, as case studies when I'm doing DEI work, all, all sorts of uh, weird and wonderful things that I do. But with the, um, well, really with COVID and uh, having to do so much remotely, I became much more aware of what was going on online and what was happening in the world around me. And I became aware of just how much input there was about climate change. Um, of course, in BC, uh, BC has been on fire, basically, for what the past five summers. Um, that affected us um, almost to the point of having to be evacuated a couple of years back if the fires got to within uh, five miles away from where we live and having to evacuate an animal sanctuary. Wow, problematic. So very big issue um, for, for us as a family. But uh, I realized that all the information that was actually being put out by the scientific community, which is quite right that they, they should be telling us what to do, was being ignored by politicians because they want to be re-elected and they, they're not going to legislate against eating habits until things get really seriously desperate. The business community at large gets away with net zero initiatives. Net zero initiatives will never be enough. The public at large isn't really aware of the difference between CO2 and methane and nitrous oxide. They don't realize the, the gases that come from animal agriculture are so, so damaging. But the principal reason why people aren't acting in, in, in my belief, and I say this as an adult educator, is because passive education techniques are being used. We are given information and then what we do with it is very much up to us. We can, we can choose to go and do something. We can, and most people say, oh, I'm turning off my lights or I'm, I'm not driving my car on this day. And then they think that's enough. And what we need is active education. But active education that not only puts people on the spot in terms of uh, this is your responsibility too, but actually asks them for a commitment and challenges them to make a difference and really gets them to sign up to it. So with a colleague of mine from uh, the UK who I'd known years ago because I actually trained her, we, we formed uh, Plant Based Future, which really is, is again, what I, would, what I would term for good entrepreneurism. And what we're attempting to do is influence major companies around the world to actually implement education about climate change and it's kind of skunk work to me, if you're familiar with that wonderful American term. Um, I am very interested in, in mitigating climate change, but I see it as a way to help animals and, and stop the terrible things that actually go on. So basically, we, we've contacted some, some very major companies, HSBC, Mike's employer. We've um, had communications with Deloitte, with Dell EMC, all, all sorts of companies who are supposedly interested in sustainability. And they hear our pitch and they say, wow, yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting. That, that's really good. So what are you going to do about it? And they're, they're kind of waiting for who's going to be brave enough to, to do this first, to actually actively ask people to make a difference. What people don't necessarily know is that the whole of the Net Zero Initiative has been basically um, a process of embarrassment. So if I were to cite, say, the example of, of, of net zero initiatives within the, uh, the, the drug industry, well, it all began when the CEO of Johnson & Johnson at a conference was asked what Johnson & Johnson were going to do about uh, global emissions of CO2. And he came up with an answer. And then at the end of his presentation about what he was going to do about it, he said, and I now challenge all of the other major businesses in this area to do something similar. And by the end of that week, half of the major uh, drug companies had come up with their own strategies for achieving net zero. What we're trying to do is get them to do the same, but make it more personal. Um, Johan Rockström, who's a particular hero of mine, actually said we need a symphony of 
science, business, citizenry and politics. Well, we're not going to get anything without engaging citizenry. That needs to happen. And that's really what I'm trying to get to happen now. I do apologize. That's a very long answer to a very short question, Justin. Absolutely no apology needed. You're, you're right. That is, there's a lot in there and it just goes to describe centered around someone's entrepreneur origin. So very seldom is it black and white, cut and dry, clear. Oftentimes there is a lot rolled into that, which you described for yourself in your journey. So a lot of people can resonate with that and a lot of amazing points and comments, which leads us into the next question, which is centered around transformations or trends. Maybe you're going to speak to this from a diversity, equity, inclusion, organizational development angle. Maybe it's about animal sanctuaries. However, you want to take that question, but specific to the industry that you're passionate about, what are some trends or transformations? Transformations that are happening or need to happen. Um, yeah. But, I mean, the things that I'm seeing most of at the moment is we're, we're getting uh, a growing dominance of what you probably know as, as, as Generation Z at, uh, attitudes or Generation Z, if we want to do American speak. Um, so many younger people um, are actually recognizing that the companies that they want to work for need to have ESG initiatives in place. They need to have DEI in place. What I would like to see included in that is, is more inclusion of veganism as a component of DEI. Because if you ask anybody what DEI is, or you actually read books about it, and, and, and I do, um, they don't mention eating habits as being an issue, and yet it is so much that there is so much prejudice and bias against vegans that is um, not only health unhealthy, it, it's damaging to the people who are rebutting the existence of the, of the movement as, it, as it's coming up. Transitions I'm seeing in relation to the amount of interest that there is in investment in, in plant-based eating. Lots and lots of interest in it. And one of the things that I'm saddened about when I see that, and it kind of relates to, to what we're trying to do with plant-based future, is that there is an assumption that the market will respond positively to all of these good new products that are coming along. So we've got vegan cheeses, we've got the, uh, the, the meat, which is you know, going on in leaps and bounds. We've got all these great things happening. And yet people still don't see the need to make the transition for themselves other than by interest or maybe veganuary or something that, that, that might be a short-term transition. And what we're trying to do really should go hand in hand with what the plant-based industry as a whole is trying to do, which is change consumer habits. We need people to start off by eating plant-based just, just once a week. And when they get to do it once a week and they realize it's great and they can enjoy it and they'll be getting very, very good foods, it's a very short step to going twice a week and three times a week and then moving the whole of society. We can move society. I mean, you've probably seen all the quotes about, you know, it only takes a, a small group of concerned people to actually make a change. Well, it can because we start cascades in that way. And the way it relates to what I've done historically with, with learning processes is when you've got a group of people in a room and you're trying to train them to be more effective as leaders, if they don't try to enact what you're telling them to do, there is an embarrassment factor. The whole world needs embarrassment factor at the moment. But the embarrassment factor for most people is never going to be around animals because they're so inured against that. It's going to come around saving the planet on which they live. People act out of vested interest, self-interest. And if we can actually create the mindset, we can bring about a, a, a huge transition, I believe, very, very quickly. You've just got to catch the right player to actually start it in the first place. And it takes a very brave corporate to do that. So sorry, kind of rambling. Again, I ramble a lot, don't I? Um, but yeah, that, that's what I see is some major and significant transitions that, 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 that are affecting me, and, but also that I'm trying to affect as well. Very, very exciting and uh, interesting to think of that inevitable tipping point, as you mentioned. So plant-based future, 
The mm. next question is, where is plant-based future going in mm. the future? And it's usually yeah. best for those listening to hear uh, a, a quick summary of, you know, how it began, where we're at today and that mm. path. And then that's a good springboard of where you're going mm. in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it, it began with the two of us, um, myself and my colleague from, from the UK. It's actually registered in the UK. Um, we registered in the UK because we actually entered a competition which is run by Carrefour. Now, Carrefour have something like um, 360 million employees. Sorry, 360,000 employees. Wow, 360 million. That would be a lot. Um, but their, 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 their reach with their customers is, is vast. So what we were trying to do was to get them to actually um, implement the, the process that we had suggested with all of their staff. And the part that I haven't mentioned is that there's an app. When you actually sign up to the app, the app gives you reminders that you need, to, that you're committed to going vegan for a certain amount of uh, days in a week. Um, it suggests recipes. It will give you um, links to where you can go and get vegan food. It, it does all sorts of things. It would have been a great way of driving uh, things to, to car for, customers to car for, they weren't interested in implementing. We didn't get anywhere. So we're still banging the drum, lobbying with, with corporates. We got, I guess, as far as we, we could with Deloitte. Um, you might have seen that Deloitte, with their 320,000 staff globally, have implemented um, a climate change education policy. Um, what they didn't do or what they wouldn't do is use the app. They wouldn't actually commit to asking people to do something different. Instead, they used um, a version of uh, an app that they created for themselves, which, which tells you, oh, if you turned off a light bulb at this point, it wouldn't make that much difference. It doesn't even mention food. So where are we going? Well, I'll, I'll be perfectly blunt with you, Justin. At this moment, I am uh, quite depressed and cynical about where it's going because we've been for three years and we can't get anybody to do the damn thing so if anybody out there knows of any corporate that's brave and really wants to make a difference like that, let, let me tell you my opening question to sustainability heads who are invariably the first point of contact other than hsbc because i trained the ceo i say are you serious about sustainability and they say oh yes yes so are you actually just trying to achieve net zero or are you trying to save the world and there's a pause. And nine out of 10 will say, I'm trying to save the world. So don't you think you should be prepared to do anything it takes to save the world? Yes. And that's my lead into the description of, of the app and what it does and what we're trying to achieve. And they still won't do it. I, I, I don't know, to be honest, Justin, I, I, I'm vaguely in despair about, about what we can do, but that doesn't mean that I'll stop. Every time we get turned down by one of the major corporates, it's it's a knockback. Um, but I keep getting up again, and I will keep getting up. Well, everybody in whichever industry they're in, whether that's CPG, fashion, services, whatever it might be, entrepreneurship is exactly that. It's the classic uh, one more no or one more door shut. It's just another yeah. run closer to a yes and an open door. So. Um, Absolutely. And, and exactly to echo what you said, everybody and anybody who's listening who is in a position um, with um, the quote sustainability heads in, in corporate, um, take this on, reach out to Mark, uh, very easy to contact. But uh, moving on to the next question is centered around charities and giving back. So what does Plant Based Future or you yourself, Mark, do in terms of giving back and charity? Or what does it mean to you? Um, yeah, interesting question. Um, put it this way, when I had money, <laughs> I was always able to support charities. Um, maybe to my shame, all of the charities I ever supported were always around animal care. When I was in the UK, it was the RSPCA, it was the Whale and Dolphin Conservation Society, um, PETA, uh, Greenpeace, those sorts of organisations. I was a big fan. Now, um, I'm... <laughs> Running an animal sanctuary takes a lot of money. And I, to be honest, I don't have a lot of money left for charity. In fact, I don't have any left for charity. We, we basically survive off the charity of others. Um, the area that we live in, big farming community, we're not popular, we're known as the vegan cult locally. Um, and they can't understand why we're not killing animals. Somebody actually wrote uh, uh, an assessment of us upon 
our Google page saying that we bred animals here to be killed to feed to, feed to our dogs, which is just such nonsense. So sorry, I, I can't say that I'm a terribly charitable person when it comes to giving at the moment. I would like to be, but not at the moment. And is um, is the um, animal sanctuary, um, obviously not, I don't mean just an animal sanctuary, but is it just an animal sanctuary or is it a charity mm. in and of itself? Mm. Um, no, we, we got to the point, we, we'd hired a lawyer, um, we got to um, registering as a charity and we decided to back off. There is, there is too much uh, control that goes on with it that we couldn't justify it. So we're a not-for-profit. Perfect. There you go. Ex excellent. So, um, and and forgot to say in any of these questions and leading up to it, absolutely with everybody that we speak to, all these value aligned impact entrepreneurs, zero wrong answers. It is all good. So the next question for you, Mark, is centered around resources. You had mm -hmm. already mentioned that website, uh, Redefining Animal Slaughter as Murder. Um, yeah. Are there any resources in the form of maybe books, mm -hmm. podcasts? Mm -hmm maybe even apps on your phone, whether it's related to leadership or mental health, or are there any yeah. resources that you want to share with folks listening? Yeah. Um, I, I, I guess I, I tend not to follow apps and, and uh, books and so on as much as I do people. Um, and I'm a particular fan of, of the outpourings of certain people because of the value added that I get from them personally. And it encourages me and it actually inspires me to see what they're doing. So my particular favorites, um, who you probably, most of you have heard of, um, Dr. Malani Joy, who I just think is, is superb. There is a lot of um, disparate thinking in the animal welfare community. And she's, she's, she tries to put that right. I think she's brilliant. Uh, Philip Wallam, if you've heard of Philip, he was uh, a general manager of Citibank. He's turned animal activist. And he's a great guy, um, well worth following. He makes some very, very inspiring speeches. He doesn't pull his punches, um, Australian, um, very hard hitting, well worth following. Um, Earthling Ed, of course, I'm a big fan of Ed. Um, he speaks my language, <laughs> We're both from the UK, and I can get what he says. I'm also a, a great follower of a, a professor of business ethics called Guido Palazzo. Um, and he's not afraid to take on anybody about anything, even to the point of death threats, because he took on the, the mafia in southern Italy. Um, so this guy, uh, University of Lausanne, very good guy. And then businesses, um, I am a, a huge fan of, of ProVeg, which I'm sure you all know, and also Blue Horizon. Um, I think uh, Bjorn Witte and, and his crew are doing uh, some great stuff there. Um, so they, they would be, if you like, uh, both my resources and my inspiration. I think I need people um, who are blunt talkers, who, who will tell it like it is um, and are not afraid to, to say what they really think and feel. Um, I guess I come from the, the, the camp in my thinking, which says, uh, let, let's call a spade a spade. Um, and, and, and tell it like it is. And there is too little time left now i believe for the for the planet as a whole for us to not be getting down to the nitty-gritty of the things that we need to have as agenda items on everybody's um conversation wow okay Th that was incredible because you just took uh the next question as well which is centered around inspiration what does it mean to you sources of inspiration not only did you take that and give us those uh individuals com and companies but you also told us the reason or essentially you told us what inspiration inspiration means to you, which is honesty, transparency, uh, transparency, clarity, yeah. getting to the point, not, you know, beating around the bush, that kind of thing. With that being said, before we get on to the next question, is there anything else from a leadership standpoint or any other standpoint that you want to touch on further around inspiration or do you want to move on to the next question? Um, no, that, that's, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, it all, almost comes back to one of the, the, the trend things that we, that we were talking about a, a bit earlier on. One of my bugbears about what, what's going on at the moment is that we have this, this development of what some people would call a, a woke society. Um, I think if, in, in many respects, that, that's a great thing. It, it really is. And I think we need to have more tolerance, more acceptance. Why can't people 
just do what they want to do, providing it does no harm. The concept of harm for me is, is a big one because harm brings in animals as well. We shouldn't be harming these creatures. They're not there for our benefit. They should be allowed to do their own thing and be left alone. But what I'm seeing increasingly in, in the business world, in the connections that I do still have, is what I call soundbite leadership. And we're getting little bits of, of glib, platitudinal talk that, that, that means nothing. And everybody's going, oh, wow, yeah, that's fantastic. I agree with that. That's great, isn't it? And it's not. It's, it's, it lacks in substance. It lacks in import. It lacks in direction. It lacks in everything, anything substantive. And we need substantial, substantial happenings around us within the world as a whole, within what we're doing with society, within who we follow as leaders. Um, sorry, that, that's a soapbox for me, but um, you gave me the opportunity to say that. So I yeah, absolutely. Totally your opportunity. And hopefully for anybody listening, there's probably a, a lot of people listening who face that internal battle of like, ooh, do I say what I really want to say? Ooh, do I do what I really know that I should do? And yeah. This has been on yeah. my heart or soul for years. Yeah. Should I do it? So hopefully you're yeah. touching on what inspiration means is going to uh, transfer into somebody else who will take that leap and make that decision. So that's amazing. So, well, well, you know what, Justin, it, it's it's an issue of cognitive dissonance that, that's actually created by a, a lack of almost self honesty at, at some level. But there's also an issue, a big issue of critical thinking, and we we evaluate so little of what we see. We just accept without thinking about it and. So many people out there who, who are so negative in their response to veganism, I just want to say to them, have you actually stopped and really thought about this and actually processed? Because, you know, the, the, the kind of stories or the things that, that you see posted on LinkedIn, say, you, if you were driving your car, would you, would you swerve to avoid a bird? And yes. Well, well, why? Have you actually processed that and what it actually means? And it's just that there is so little thought being given to the whole world around us from my perspective. And it's, uh, it's frustrating for an old man like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, old man or however you identify, I'm sure it's frustrating for a, for, for a lot of folks. And uh, again, hopefully um, those words really resonate with just even one person about um, saying what you feel, doing what you feel is, is the right way yeah. to move. So the last conversation starter question for you today, Mark, uh, from us here is around, you've already done a lot of this, but it's sort of the outro question and it's around tips, lessons, wisdom, maybe or maybe not framed as advice, really just uh, things that you picked up that you think anybody listening, whether they're an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, working for a company, whatever, all different sorts of people are going to be listening. Yeah. Is there anything that you want to impart on yeah. them as your final words? Well, I, I can sum up, if you like, my, my whole philosophy to, to life, the universe and everything by using a quote um, that I borrowed from my favorite movie of all time. Anybody ever asked me what my favorite movie is, I have no hesitation. And it's the Australian movie by Baz Luhrmann, Strictly Ballroom, if you've ever seen that. If you haven't, great movie. The quote is, a life lived in fear is a life half lived. And I believe if you approach any aspect of your life with fear, you're not living. Um, you, everybody should go for it. And that includes those people who are trying to make a difference in the world more so than anybody else. I think there's a lot of criticism that is leveled at people who are trying to make a difference, which is utterly unjust. Um, and I think the result of that is that too many people are actually fearful of the consequences of doing what they know is right. So it comes back to the cognitive dissonance thing. It comes back to taking the bull by the horns, being honest, standing up for yourself, but also standing up for animals. Um, and, and sorry if this is, is boring to people who aren't as committed a vegan as I am, but it's they don't have voices. We do. We should be speaking for them. So a life lived in fear is a life half lived. Go for it. You heard it there, folks. And there's always people like this 
Uh, you just have to find them. So if there's people who aren't like this, who are making you worried about how you might be perceived out there in the world, just know that there are people who will encourage you, support you, and uh, back you for what it is that you're trying to do. Uh, there are always those people out there for sure. Um, so absolutely amazing. And before we let people know where they can find out more online about Plant-Based Future, Mark, is there is there anything, announcements, any last words, anything that came up that we missed? I don't think so. Uh, Justin, thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to, to speak to you today. Um, I've really enjoyed it. Um, I'm sorry if I went on too many rants <laughs> no in true canadian fashion apologizing when you don't need to it's been absolutely a pleasure we thank you so much for your time and for everybody listening across the country because that is veg networking canada is across the country uh, you can find out more and even if you're not from canada of course you can find out more online www.plant-based-future.com plant-based future with a couple dashes in there so everybody, thank you so much for sharing your time with us here. Uh, this has been another episode of Veg Networking Canada where we had an excellent conversation and pleased to introduce um, the co-founder of Plant-Based Future, Mark Starmer. And for everybody else, we'll catch you very soon for another episode of Veg Networking Canada. And until then, bye for now. Take care. <laughs>